Let's see. Hey everybody, so this is our last uh, recording for this unit. Um, and then next week we'll move on to module two where we'll start by looking at the Rococo, we'll look at some neoclassicism, some other good stuff. But this uh, is about Baroque in Northern Europe. So hopefully you've looked at all the other lectures in this module so far. It's kind of a bigger one. This is one of the larger modules in terms of subject matter covered for uh, this class. Okay, so first let's talk a little bit about what's going on in Europe at this time. Um, so in the last video on the Baroque in Italy I, and Spain, I talked about the peace of Westphalia. So I, I didn't go in as much to what was what that means and what that was actually doing. So let me tell you a little bit more about that just to give you context. So in the 17th and um, early 18th century, um, basically there's just tons of conflict and war in Europe. There's only like four years where there's no war happening somewhere. Thirty Years War is a really prominent conflict. It's happening from 1618 to 1648. 1648 is when we get the Peace of Westphalia. Okay, so this conflict involved basically everybody in Europe. Spain, France, Sweden, um, Austria, Germany, Poland, Denmark, the Ottoman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, the Netherlands, kind of like everybody is involved in this. Um, and after the Peace of Westphalia is signed, which I talked about its implications of free religion, so we have um, Protestants and Catholics who are both okay to exist. It kind of gets rid of the idea of this united one Christendom, one version of Christianity. Um, the other things it does is we have a kind of a shake up in power. So the Netherlands, Sweden, and France expand their power, gain authority. Um, Spain and the Danes lose some of their power and are somewhat diminished in authority. Um, so 1609, um, we have in the non-war, non-religion area, we have um, the Dutch found the Bank of Amsterdam. So I've talked about throughout this module how um, banking is kind of important in the foundation of a merchant class during this time. The Bank of Amsterdam overpasses Antwerp as being one of these big financial powers. Um, and these kinds of systems are just further established that help with um, business in, in the merchant class and development of a um, of a middle class of people, basically. Okay, so that's a little more context on that. Now let's talk about some art. So the greatest uh, 17th century Flemish painter is this guy. He's pretty famous, uh, Peter Paul Rubens. You've maybe heard of him. Sometimes people describe women as being Rubenesque. That tends to mean you're a little more voluptuous and curvy. That is a reference to this artist, Peter Paul Rubens. Um, he's born in 1577 and he lives until um, 1640, 1640s, somewhere in there. Uh, okay, so he's an interesting guy. Um, he kind of synthesized the styles of a lot of prominent artists from Italy. Um, even though he's Flemish, he studies Italian artists, um, particularly Michelangelo, Titian, um, Caravaggio. These are all artists that he's very influenced by, and he kind of takes like a sampling of each of their styles and makes his own kind of style, and then his style becomes the template for a lot of Northern European artists during the Baroque. So he sort of sets the the tone and the style for a lot of work that follows him during this period. Um, he's an interesting figure. He had an aristocratic education. He's very well educated. Um, he spoke several languages. He was very good at languages. Um, so he tend to socialize with like kind of the higher up people of the nobility, royalty. Um, he also was very well read and well educated, as I said, so he, he would also kind of party with scholars. So he's in this really um, kind of upper crust situation. Um, he was good friends with uh, Philip IV, who was the King of Spain. We've talked about him a little bit. He was a court painter for Charles I of England, the King of England. He was a favorite painter of Marie de Medici of France. So she's the widow of the French king, and she's of the Medicis from Florence, Italy, the big banking family. So she's kind of a double whammy, big deal, prestigious person. Um, he was a permanent court painter to the Spanish rulers of Flanders. Um, 
And because of all these connections and how educated he was and how good he was at languages, he is not just an artist at this time, he's also a diplomat. So he was sent on important diplomatic missions by lots of different various governments in Europe. So he travels quite a lot and he becomes this kind of very prestigious and therefore even more influential sort of figure, not just as an artist, but um, as kind of a influencer, I guess, in modern vernacular. Uh, so he's, he's um, a well-positioned guy that a lot of people look up to, so his style becomes very prominent. Okay, so let's look at this particular painting. This is called The Consequences of War, um, and it was painted for uh, Fernando II de Medici. He's the um, Grand Duke of Tuscany. So Tuscany is that region of Italy where Florence is, Florence and Siena. Uh, so this is a pretty interesting painting. Let's take a close look at it. It's pretty chaotic, as you can see. It's a fairly chaotic scene. Um, you can see the, the dynamism and the high drama that we saw from our Italian Baroque painters. Remember, Peter Paul Rubens is influenced by Caravaggio. And we can see this kind of dramatic uh, composition going on. But his is even maybe a little more chaotic. Um, so he used this commission from Fernando II, the Grand Duke of Florence, as an opportunity to um, express his desire for peace, not just as a painter, but as a diplomat. He was really tired of, as were a lot of people of Europe, just being kind of constantly in a state of war during this time. Um, so this painting is, is really a direct commentary um, on the Thirty Years' War and that he didn't like it. He was pretty anti-war. Um, so let's look at what's happening here. Our central figure, um, even though he's kind of dark and a little bit hard to see, is Mars. So he's the one who has this kind of red cape. He has a bloody sword in his hand. He's wearing a um, military helmet. So Mars is the god of war, right? So we have Mars, and he is leaving the open temple door to the temple of Janus. Now, according to Roman tradition, when the door to the Temple of Janus is open, it's wartime, and when it's closed, it's peacetime. So this is obviously wartime. The mostly naked woman clinging to Mars is Venus. Venus was Mars's mistress. And Venus, of course, is the goddess of love. So she and Cupid and some of these uh, little angel putti type figures are clinging to him and trying to get him to stop and trying to distract him from making war and to come and have love and peace instead of war. It does not work. He is still going forward. Um, from his other side, the Fury Electo is this figure who is holding a torch and kind of grabbing Mars and dragging him forward. So the Furies like to make war, so she's interested in making war. Um, in the background, it's kind of hard to see, but in the cloud-like area below the torch, there's two monsters. These monsters are supposed to represent pestilence and famine, which if you know anything about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, war, pestilence, and famine kind of all go together. <coughs> so they're, they're war's partners, essentially, in terms of bad things happening. So we have pestilence and famine in the background. Um, on the ground, with her back to us in the foreground, she has kind of a braided bun. We see this female figure who's holding a broken lute. Um, so she is Harmony, she's the personification of Harmony, and since her lute is broken and she's about to get trampled, it's kind of showing the way um, war tramples over and destroys Harmony. Also on the ground is a woman with her child, they're also about to be trampled. This shows that um, family, procreation, charity, all things that are also crushed during wartime. Um, the man on his back on the ground is an architect. He, if you look at his hands, he's holding his architectural instruments. So he kind of represents how in times of peace, there's progress in terms of the decorative arts, in terms of building and architecture and intellectual pursuits. So he's showing that the intellectual um, and aesthetic pursuits are also crushed by war. So that's why he is on the ground. Um, also showing this, we have um, under Mars's foot, he's literally stomping on a book and below that a drawing. So basically he's tromping all, all over arts and letters in general. Um, we also have in the foreground on the ground under Cupid's feet, unbound arrows. Um, when they're uh, bound together, that shows concord. So when they're unbound, that is discord, chaos. 
Um, we also have an olive branch and a staff on the ground that are cast aside, so those are symbols of peace that have been discarded. Uh, the grief-stricken woman who's kind of flailing with her arms in the air wearing black is Europe. That's the personification of Europe. Her attribute is um, the globe topped with a cross, which a little angel next to her is holding. So she is in distress because she's tired of being ravaged by war. Europe is tired of being ravaged by war. Okay, so here's just kind of a close-up. And you can see the way he's also utilizing these dynamic, strong diagonal lines and composition, like Caravaggio was doing, like Artemisia Genelescu is doing. So he's also interested in um, ideas of dynamism and in, uh, composition. This is a self-portrait. He did quite a few self-portraits. Um, so that is him. And you can see even when he's doing a straightforward portrait that doesn't have a lot of drama and dynamism, in terms of the subject matter, it still has very dramatic light, right? Like we see how his face is very well lit and the rest of him has like kind of a deep shadow. This is another uh, famous work of his. So when he was um, 23, he left Flanders. Remember he's Flemish, so he leaves Flanders and he goes south, he goes to Italy, and he stayed there for eight years from uh, 1600 to 1608. And it's at this time that he gets a lot of influence from Italian masters, and it becomes quite evident in his work. Um, the heavily muscled bodies, for example, that are twisting are definitely reminiscent of Michelangelo. We know from his notebooks that he did many, many sketches of Michelangelo's work, particularly at the Sistine Chapel. And um, he, he really studied a lot of um, the Italian masters. Uh, so in this work, The Elevation of the Cross, we also see that he's exploring um, foreshortened anatomy. We can see how Jesus is foreshortened on the cross, how we have this huge vertical, uh, not vertical, excuse me, diagonal line in the middle of the composition that's really uh, drawing our eye upward. We have it going upward and backward so that we're having this foreshortening that's making it more dramatic, more um, dynamic. Um, we also see this heroic exertion, which is a phrase that um, is also affiliated with Michelangelo, in that we have these really, all the muscles on everybody are very strained, so we're really showing the, the hero's kind of body of anatomy that's very muscly and engaged. So there's a lot of tension, right? There's a lot of physical tension in this image, everybody's straining. There's also a lot of emotional tension in this image. Okay, so we see the diagonals, um, we see the way Christ cuts diagonally across the composition, um, and the human body in action like this becomes one of the focuses of Rubens' work. This is something we see over and over again in his work. Okay, this is just that piece in situ, so it's a, it's a um, altar piece. Okay, for something completely different, another uh, hallmark of the northern Baroque is um, still lifes. We see still lifes become very popular at this time, and they're sort of a new thing. Um, so this is a one of the first pioneers of still life painting uh, is Clara Peters. So she becomes extremely well known for her very realistic still lifes. She does a lot of things like this where she'll have some food items and some flowers. This becomes the standard of the time. She was very interested in um, showing that uh, kind of, as we've looked throughout this module at the Northern Painters, they're very interested in that encyclopedic detail. She's no exception. She's very interested in this. She's also interested in depth and experimenting with how depth is shown. So we have this leaf at the bottom that's kind of coming off the edge of the table, which makes it feel almost like it's coming forward into the viewer's area, like it's breaking the plane of the painting, like you're actually sitting down for breakfast here. Um, so she, let's see, she's born in 1594, uh, she dies in 1657, and she makes many, many, many still lifes. That's predominantly what she does. She kind of lays the groundwork for the um, Northern Masters of Still Life, which is Rachel Royce, which one of you is writing about, uh, Peter Klatz, Willem Kalf, all those kind of guys. So she kind of came first and really pioneered this as an art form. Okay. Uh, Franz Hals, he's a Dutch painter. He's born in 1581. 
Um, and he's known for group portraits. So we've seen a lot of portraiture so far in this module, but it's generally following this tradition of portraiture, which is the person is posed in one of several kind of typical ways. They often um, have their best like clothes on. They often have a setting that shows like their nobility and how wealthy they are. Well, this is not so much a thing um, in Northern um, portraiture at this time. Basically, the Calvinists, which is a kind of Protestant, are not into ostentatious settings or very decorative jewels and things like this or attire. So they're, they're more prone to wearing fairly simple outfits and all kind of dressing similarly in dark clothing with very little ornamentation. So because of these changes, um, Franz Halls uh, produced these totally different kinds of portraits where the liveliness and the interest comes from the group dynamic and also the way the individual um, people within the group are expressing themselves and their facial features. So we get these kind of lively group portraits that feel like they're just sort of spur of the moment, almost like they're just a snapped photo. That's obviously before photography. But so he develops this very different kind of style of portraiture. Um, he used light, rapid brush strokes that kind of um, lay some groundwork for much later when we talk about Impressionism. He's very interested in capturing light and in capturing things quickly and, and getting this kind of sense of spontaneity. Um, the group portraits also have um, a social function. So one of the other tenants within the um, northern populations remember humanism is still a big thing so part of that is civic duty so a lot of these um, portraits are of groups of people that civilians were members of and they were proud to show that they were serving in an organization as part of their civic duty so the archers of saint hadrian which are depicted here were a citizen's militia and uh, there were several groups like this that kind of claim credit for liberating the dutch republic um, from spain so they're very proud of this. They're very proud of their organization and their service. Um, so in this painting, we have action. We have some variety in terms of the composition, uh, but we also see the individuality of each person. And they're all equally visible, right? There's not like one guy's face highlighted and everybody else in shadow. You can see each face just as clearly as the next. Okay, another um, esteemed portrait artist of this time was uh, Judith Leister. Um, so she was born in 1609 and died in the 1660s. Um, and she, for a long time, people actually thought this particular painting was not a self-portrait, but was a portrait of her by Franz Hall, the guy that we were just looking at. It is a self-portrait. This was later verified. Um, so they knew each other. They were associates. Uh, she wasn't exactly a direct pupil of his, but she was an associate and she definitely observed him and took some cues from his style. She also, as you can see, uses these kind of quick light brush strokes. We have sort of an expressive treatment of the lace on her collar. It's not that really, really crystal sharp encyclopedic detail that we've seen before. It's a little bit looser, a little more, um, there's a little more spontaneity to it. Uh, in this portrait, it's interesting because we have this detailed, precise kind of look at her um, but it also has that spark of spontaneity. She's also telling us quite a bit about herself. So she's not wearing a painter's smock. She's dressed like an elegant um, lady of well-to-do means of, of the time. She's doing a genre painting uh, on her canvas, which is what she was kind of known for in terms of portraiture. She did a lot of genre paintings. She also um, did still lives. She's showing herself as a painter. She's also looking directly at us, right? She's looking directly at the viewer and she has this kind of like a little bit of a smirky kind of smile. So she's very self-assured, she's very confident. So we're, we're learning uh, quite a lot about her from this image and she's definitely an interesting painter of the time. I also, if you look in the red in her dress where she's sitting, those kind of really gestural brush strokes are pretty fantastic. They remind me a little of El Greco. Okay. Another uh, super famous painter of the Northern Baroque is Rembrandt. So Rembrandt's full name is Rembrandt van Rijn. You have maybe heard of him. He's another kind of superstar guy. He's born in 1606 and he dies in 1669 or 70, I think. Um, 
he's kind of an under, he's another one of those guys that's considered a genius. He's like an undisputed genius of art history. He was the leading painter of his time. And he um, reminds us in a lot of ways of Caravaggio and Artemisia Gentileschi, right? He definitely has this interest in um, tenebrism and the play of light and dark, of highlight and shadow. We also see that he was taking some cues from Franz Hals, right? We have the group portrait kind of thing happening. Um, he moves to Amsterdam. He's born in uh, Leiden, I think, which is a smaller town. So he moves to Amsterdam in 1631. And shortly after that, he paints this, um, <laughs> this very interesting group portrait. So this was commissioned by uh, the Surgeon's Guild. Um, just like artists and masons, surgeons had guilds as well, and that's how they trained. Um, and they wanted a group portrait done, right? Because this is kind of the style of the time. And he thought it would be a great idea. Rembrandt's like, well, why don't I do something where you're in action? What if we have uh, your guild leader, which is Dr. Tulp there, showing you um, an anatomy lesson on this corpse so that you're actually engaged in what it is that you do? So this was um, kind of a, another new idea. It's a little bit grotesque, but they obviously loved it. They went for it. Um, so it's it's also, it's not just an unusual composition because it's a portrait that has a dead person being dissected in it, which is certainly unusual. It's also unusual because it's kind of asymmetrical. So you see you have all the members of the guild off to the left, and you have this one figure who's a little more central and a little more towards the right who has a different outfit and a darker outfit and is portrayed a little more crisply in focus. Well, that's Dr. Tulp, that's the one who's leading the lesson. So we have this kind of asymmetrical balance where we have more figures over here, but they're kind of balanced out by this darkness. We also see um, the foreshortening of the corpse. So this is another study in, in foreshortening, which is important to the kind of action paintings of the Baroque. Even though our corpse is not doing a whole lot, he's just laying there, he's still foreshortened. Um, so it's a very interesting portrait. Um, and again, like the other group portraits we've looked at, each student is clearly portrayed. So even though Dr. Tulp is kind of the central figure, we can see all of their individual faces quite clearly. So it truly is uh, an exercise in portraiture, even though it's, it's a group scene. Okay, this is another uh, quite famous piece by Rembrandt. Um, it's actually called The Company of Captain Franz Van Cook. Uh, it gets called the Night Watch a lot. You might see it referenced as the Night Watch in um, reading materials. The painting wasn't actually set at night. It looked like it was at night um, until it was cleaned um, just a few years ago because the varnish had darkened it so much that it seemed like it was an even higher contrast uh, kind of Caravaggio-esque sort of study. Um, but it's not actually set at night. Um, so it's another group portrait. And we see here we have even more complexity. So everybody's holding different things. We have people standing at different levels. There's a dog in there. There's a drummer. There's some people running. So he's kind of pushing this idea of portraiture into a um, more kind of big dramatic action kind of scene. And this foreshadows what we see a lot of later when we look at romanticism. Um, so you can kind of feel the tension and the energy. You still see that he's using these extreme highlights and also dark shadows to kind of create drama. You can see that we still have a balanced composition that has a lot of diagonal lines, literal diagonal lines in the, um, the flag and in these spears and things off to the side. So we still very much have that kind of um, dynamism and energy that we see in Baroque painting. Okay, this is a very different kind of artist. So this artist's most famous piece is Girl with the Pearl Earring. I think one of you is writing about that uh, as your discussion assignment. This is Johan Vermeer. Um, he's very famous for his paintings of interior scenes like this one. He um, lives from 1632 to uh, 1675. Um, this is a very popular subject for um, as I've mentioned a couple times, we have this developing middle class. So now that they're becoming more wealthy, they can also be patrons of the arts. And one of the things that is very popular in the Northern Baroque are commissioning not just straight portraits, but these kind of contemplative interior scenes. And this is what Johann Vermeer excels at. 
So um, they offer us, as the viewer, little glimpses into the lives of the subjects, right? Into their households. They also um, often have some subtle symbolisms and things that, that express the values of the time, okay? Um, Vermeer is also an innkeeper and an art dealer. Most of his paintings were created for the same private patron. Um, and they're very idealized in terms of these values of the time. So in Woman Holding a Balance, which is what this is, we have this beautiful young woman. She's standing in her home. The light source is, you can see the light source. It's a window. And that is another um, kind of staple of Vermeer. You can, it's usually a window as the light source rather than saying a lamp or fire or something. And you can usually clearly see the light source in the painting. Um, on the table, she has all of her most precious possessions laid out. So she's of a wealthier merchant class. She has pearls, she has gold necklaces, and she's holding this delicate balance that would be used to weigh gold. Um, the balance in her hand is empty and it's perfectly balanced. There's nothing on the scales. So this symbolizes leading a uh, kind of temperate and balanced life, um, balancing your sins with virtue, right? In the background, to kind of reinforce this theme, we have a painting of the Last Judgment. In the Last Judgment, Christ is the wearer of souls, right? Determining, you know, if you're a sinner or if you're redeemed or whatever. So we're, we have kind of the metaphysical version of the scales directly behind her to sort of hammer home this idea about thinking about what kind of life you want to live to um, end up in on the right side of the balance, okay? This is another Vermeer. Uh, I include this one. It's considered to be an allegory of painting, which we saw Artemisia Genileski's allegory of painting last time, so I think it's kind of interesting to compare the different artist interpretations of them. Um, this is the one that the artist Vermeer himself considered to be his most important painting. It's one of his largest. He never sold it. He specifically did not want it sold after his death. Um, so let's take a peek at it and see why this might be. We have what could be him in his studio, that they're wearing a little bit of an older fashioned kind of um, costume from uh, basically directly prior to when he was living. The model who is being painted is dressed as Cleo, C-L-I-O. Cleo is um, from classical antiquity. She's the muse of history, okay? So she inspires writer, writers to write about history. Um, so we have the muse of history behind her. We also have a uh, map. It's a map that shows the um, provinces. So this is also a reference to history. Um, some think the light coming in alludes to the light of artistic inspiration because this is a Vermeer where we don't see the light source, which is kind of unusual. Many scholars think it's an allegory of painting, um, specifically of painting inspired by history. From some of the things that have been researched further about Vermeer, we think it's more likely that this is about art and artists transcending history and time. So artists painting history, but really being kind of um, beyond history and time, being timeless and that their work lives on longer than them. So it's kind of interesting to look at this and contrast it with uh, the Genileski painting that's also the allegory of painting. Okay, the last thing that we're going to look at in this module is uh, Nicholas Poussin. Um, so he's from Normandy. He's born in Normandy in northern France um, in 1594. He lives to 1665. Um, he spends most of his life in Rome, however. Uh, he's particularly studied Titian and Raphael. Um, he's very interested in classicism, in classical style, in Roman and Greek statues and in portrayals of that kind of classical style. So he's kind of in high contrast in that regard with his peers during the Baroque period. He's not interested in super dynamic, dramatic portrayals. That is not something he's interested in at all. He's much more interested in classical, um, classical work. He's kind of the champion of this, of classical painting in the Baroque, and he's, for that reason, a good person to end this module on because it kind of leads into what we're going to look at next um, when we get into neoclassicalism. He's, um, so he does, uh, most of his subjects for his paintings are 
either directly or loosely based on classical sculpture. When we see the female figure in this one who's very sculptural looking, we can definitely see that in the drapery of her clothing. It very much looks like classical marble carvings. Um, so a subject here in, uh, at, in Arcadia Ego is rooted in the classical world for sure. Um, rather than depicting dynamic movement and intense emotions, he's much more interested in order and stability. So it makes sense that he really liked Raphael, right? Who was more interested in order and stability as well. Um, the three shepherds here are living in Arcadia, which is supposed to be this paradise, this very idyllic kind of um, farmland uh, where bad things uh, in theory don't happen. Um, but here they're, they come upon this tomb and they're studying the inscription on a tomb. And then this strange statuesque woman comes and lays her hand on one of them, and she is uh, probably meant to represent the spirit of death. So it's this idea that um, death can always be present even in these idyllic areas, which is also kind of a um, classical subject matter. We see a lot of paintings and, and statues and work about death when we look at uh, classical work as well. So it makes sense. So uh, his style is very different from the other people in the Baroque, but it does lead us into our next module. So I hope uh, to read, I'm excited to read about your discoveries and your research and our discussion thread related to the Renaissance and the Baroque. You also have a quiz, so don't forget to do those things and I'll see you later.